Hello, I'm Andrew Carter and welcome along to this Hilton audience with Thomas Bjorn. Uh, as you might have guessed, today we have Thomas Bjorn with us. And we're also going to be asking questions through 12 very fortunate guests, courtesy of Hilton, who are here to ask their questions of the 2018 successful winning Ryder Cup captain and a man who won 15 times on the European Tour. And uh, perhaps his wins in the future as well. We'll ask him uh, what he thinks about his future in golf and his past and his current. He is, of course, Thomas Bjorn, so a round of applause, a virtual round of applause and some actual applause for Thomas Bjorn. Thomas, how are you? I'm great, yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, strange times, but uh, we're very fortunate, to be honest, being where we are. Uh, so, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I like that. That was very typical of everyone's answer at the moment when you say, how are you? Yeah. You say, oh, I'm fine. But I suppose being a professional golfer, you're very aware that you do have some fortune in still being able to do your job, even if it's very different at the moment. Yeah, I, I, you know, you you walk out on a golf course, and like I've been, I've been in the Middle East since uh, since New Year's Eve, and and to be able to to get up in the morning and and go and hit balls and and just do that, you know, you're obviously trying to stay away from from everybody else, but uh, just to be able to go outside and do those things, and then we start playing golf tournaments, and you know, we we are very fortunate, and and feel the pain of a lot of people uh, certainly you know friends and family you know you you've got to be you got to count yourself lucky in these times it's uh, it's it's a tough old uh, thing that we we're, we're caught in the middle of and and as long as governments will let us play we'll we'll keep going to try and and, and provide some sort of entertainment to people at home that uh, that are going through some more difficult times but yeah very fortunate and and we're well aware we can be shut down at any given time so it's um, been a tournament committee chairman for many years as well so you're well aware of all the things that go on in the background uh, we have very strict regimes and we we are in our bubbles we are golf course hotel only you know the queue at uh, I came back to the hotel last night and you got about 54 Deliveroo guys standing outside trying to to pass food through the door through security that wipes it all down and players can't get out so we we're, we're in our bubbles and we're in uh, in that kind of environment uh, but that keeps us safe and it keeps us uh, away from from the public and uh, and that keeps us going so so you know all the people that are involved do a great job but it's uh, yeah it takes its toll on 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 everyone but then you've got to look at what goes on at home and and then count yourself lucky that you can do it the things I wish I'd invested in, Zoom and Deliveroo before all of this. <laughs> anyway, as you say, we have to adapt, and that's what we do here through Hilton, trying to bring people together and get them to ask you some questions. I, just one more question from me before we throw it out to the, to the floor. You're, you're obviously in Dubai, and you know, it's a place that is pretty special to you. I mean, one of your greatest victories came back in 2001. Can you just recount that? I mean, it was a great showdown you had with one of the greatest golfers of all time that week. Yeah, I, you know, I can't believe it's 20 years ago. Uh, that's that's the first thing, you know, I, I, every time I come here. Dubai is a very, you know, very special to me in the way that I lived here for, for a long time and, and back in those days. And uh, and to come here and, and always have the memory of, of playing 72 holes with, with Tiger and, and going head to head and, and standing all square on, on the 72nd hole and, and beating him is always something I would live with with fondly you know because it, it brought me into a, a world of of something different uh, not only that I could play play against the best players in the world and and on my day beat them but also it, it grew a relationship with Tiger that actually from there span over five or six years where I played pretty much every practice round with him at major championships and and saw that development of of the greatest golfer I think that's ever played you know we can we can argue back and forth about times and all that but the way he played I, it's hard to imagine that anybody in time was so much better than than everybody else they played with and and when he was on it was uh, it was pretty remarkable to watch and, and to have that kind of insight, you know, our 5.30 practice rounds at, at Lytham one year in the morning, uh, sitting on the reins at 8.30 and everybody comes up to you and says, well, you want to go and play and you already played 18 holes. But to have those three hours with him where you, on the golf course, where you just talk golf, talked about how to play the game and how he saw the game, which was so different than everybody else. And yeah, it was, uh, it was great. 
a great seat to have for, for a lot of years there, to, to be close to him golfing-wise. I don't think anybody ever got close to him uh, of the players outside the, outside the, the tournaments. But um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, that tournament victory led into that. A lot of respect and a lot of time for each other. Uh, just quickly one more on that. Did you realise at the time that not just was he an amazing golfer, but that there was something special about him and his presence and his celebrity? As you said, you had to, he had to go out at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning in the Open Championship to get rounds before practice rounds so he, he wouldn't get mobbed. Yeah, I mean that was the way it was. You know, you it was it was Tiger and and Steve Williams and Butch Harmon and two police officers and me and my caddy. You know, that's that's how we played practice rounds and that's that was you know and you get round to eleven or twelve before the public came in on a golf course and and they would all run out to see him and then you could see him just getting back in and and maybe hit hit a little bit of balls and then get out of there just for purely the celebrity status of him. And you always, you know, you talk to him about how he did things, you know, the amount of times when when I walked into a restaurant when it opened in the evening and he was on his way out, so he would eat dinner in restaurants before the restaurants opened, just because he that was the only way he could go out and eat, you know. So it, it was it was interesting to watch it. Um it was one of those things where you looked at a sports star and you said, Well, you know, for all the money in the world and for all the things that you achieved, I'm not sure I would want your life. You know, it was uh, it was tough to watch sometimes. I do all those things as well, but only because I'm antisocial as well. <laughs> so, right, let's get on to the questions. Tom Riley, fire away with your question to Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, a lot of us are obviously stuck at home and can't get out to a course or even a driving range. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe suggest a drill or a form of practice we can do from home with relatively little space? Yeah, um, well, the one thing I always say to people is that the setup in golf uh, is something that you you can always work on at home and should probably be worked on at home more than it should on, on, a, on a driving range. As soon as you, you get on a driving range and you get a club in your hand, you react to the club more than you react to. So really get that kind of strong feeling. I mean, get, get a few tips up on... Uh, on, on the on the internet on how you stand over a golf ball and then I always say to people get yourself a putting mat at least you can putt inside you know that's uh, that's always a great thing and it gets uh, an hour going by not watching TV or reading a book you know so get yourself a putting mat um, they are I mean they're as good as standing on a on a green but um, but posture is the one thing that you can always work on um, go on you know that's thousands of, of videos on, on online where you can see how to stand over the golf ball and uh, and then try and, and reproduce that so when you come out and play golf at least you know how to stand and, and you've got that in, ingrown into your game. Tom Crowley, Tom are you there at the moment? Tom your question for Thomas, a lot of Tom so far. Thanks very much Thomas for doing this, um, it's, it's a great event and, and a big thrill and treat to be here with you. Um, I'd like to cast your mind back to 2006, Thomas, um, when you won the Irish Open um, by one stroke from Paul Casey. Um, and the course was Carton House in Minute. And actually, funny enough, that's my local course. And I, I live in Minute. <coughs> and uh, I'll beat the, the course is closed at the moment because of the lockdown. But I'd just like to ask you, you know, what are your memories of, of that tournament win and Carton House and Minute and, and so on? Yeah, I mean, the Irish Open is obviously a great event on, on our schedule. And, and, you know, when you come out as a young player, it's one of those, there's a few titles out there you've got your, your mindset on that you would really like to win. I got very fortunate in that, um, in that Irish Open. It went to a Monday. I remember we had some awful weather early on in the week, not like Ireland normally, but we did have that week. Um, and I shot 78 in the first round. And I remember coming off the golf course and I was playing fantastic and just, I don't know, and I had two unbelievable rounds in the second and third round. And, and it was really a, a tussle between me and Darren Clark and Paul Casey uh, going down at the end there. And, and I remember Darren three putting the last to, to make six, I think, and, and Paul also uh, made a mistake up the last and, and I had a little short putt to, to win the tournament. We were playing Wentworth the week after and I, was, I flew with Darren uh, in, uh, on his um, 
one of his private planes to um, at that time back to London. And I remember I came, he was giving me a lift and I came on the plane and I, I was like, he three putted last and I came on with a trophy on this plane and I'm thinking this is going to be a fun 45 minutes. And he looked at me as I walked on the plane and I could just see, okay, I'm just going to go and sit in the back there and say nothing. <laughs> I said nothing for 45 minutes, just sat there, hugged my trophy. And when we got to London, I was like, Thanks for the lift, Darren. <laughs> and then I walked out. He was, there was smoke coming out in his ears all the way. So um, yeah, it was. Uh, that's my best memory of that uh, that win. But you know, winning the Irish Open is always a uh, is always um, a great thing. It's a great event. And um, you know, back in the day, we 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 moved inland in Ireland and played a lot of inland golf courses in Ireland for a long time and now it seems like we we're moving back to the coast and playing some of the great Irish Lynx golf courses but it's uh, yeah for the players the Irish Open is so good because the fans and the the history of of Irish golf on the European tour is is so close to what we are so we love coming back to to Ireland and um, and have a, a few pints of Guinness uh, along with uh, playing golf Actually, one thing on Darren Clark as well, because now he is hoovering up the titles on the uh, on the seniors and the champions tour. Now you are yeah, there's a big a big day coming up in February, isn't there? Is that right? I'm trying to do the maths. Are you, are you you're closing yeah. in on on the big five. Oh, what about um about thinking about the seniors tour and yeah, I mean you, you get you know it, it's as easy as this. You know, I'm, I'm when you get to. I'm 49, getting to 50 on the 18th of February, and and you know you pitch up on on tour these days, and it's a it's a tough old job when you when you get on in age. I mean the the, the distance they hit it and the golf courses we play, we we come here. This is in Dubai. I mean it's one of my favorite uh, stops of the year, and you come here this year, and and they built four new tees, and they're all 40 yards further back. So all of a sudden. You know, you look at a couple of holes where you, yeah, we might even struggle reaching the fairway for for the way the way I I hit the ball now, and so it, it's it's really is tough to to maintain it on the main tour as as you get on, and then you know you look towards the seniors tour. So so when you when you get to this, it's I'm fortunate I can play on the main tour. Uh, I can get a, probably a few invites in America. We got a seniors tour that's being revamped in Europe as well, so so there will be some golf to be played, and and I'll try and mix and match between with between all three tours. Uh, I still love being on the main tour, but I'll probably pick the golf courses where I feel like, you know, your Valderramas, your Lynx golf courses, where Lynx might not be uh, at the premium, but when you come to certain courses today, it's uh, it's a tough old task. Well, well, let's just get the next question then, and go slightly out to turn on that theme because Barney Beden, uh, what's what's your question, Barney, for for Thomas? Yeah, hi Thomas. Um, thanks for your time. In regards to the professional game, um, you know, what is uh, the one thing that you would change to to bring the game back, you know, to an art rather than just you know the drive and, and wedge game that we see quite often. Um, you know, the professional game seems to reward the the, the, the long hitters. You know, they often win. You know, versus those with the shorter game seem to get penalised. Yeah, but I, I think so. You got to look at at the game of golf, and obviously, in all sports, equipment evolves. And and one of the things that I feel is that that when I look at look at the game of golf, one of the the manufacturers are the companies that puts the most money back into the game. So to to limit their way of going forward would be uh, would be something that's that's a very fine balance. You gotta you gotta give them a chance to keep evolving, keeping selling equipment because that's how the game of golf is is gonna keep evolving and 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 survive financially. But the one thing that that I kind of over the last six to eight months thought was an idea that doesn't get talked about a lot is to make the golf ball bigger. So if you think about it, you know, back in the day when we had a, the 162 and we went to a 168 size golf ball, uh, that was for the same reasons. If you if you get went to 172 uh, as a golf ball size, well then you wind resistant would be just automatically make it uh, make the golf ball slower uh, and that will that will drag it back to to where distance is 
you know, is not that much as a premium. And, and I think that's that's the one thing that would be a very easy solution because you could all even keep the 168 in the amateur game and then just move to a 172 size golf ball in the professional game just to, to kind of, and that would be an easy, much easier switch for the amateurs than you know, we, I don't think we can get to a, a place where we make a difference in equipment uh, for the amateurs because then it becomes a completely different game and the switch would be too big. But I like the, where golf is with the equipment for the amateur golfers and certainly for guys like you that play the game. You know, it, it makes the game easier, it makes it a little bit more enjoyable. You know, if we stuck wooden drivers back in everybody's hands, it would be uh, a lot of people would find the game of golf extremely difficult and maybe not enjoy it as much. So, so it's uh, for me the golf uh, the solution is the bigger ball. If you get an Open Championship at St Andrews, you know, and you get 26 degrees and no wind for four days, we're going to see some low scorings. And I, I don't. You know, I still want to see the great golf courses of the world stand up to the best players in the world, uh, but they could uh, they could end up. You know, some of the longest hitters out here they could end up driving seven or eight greens around St Andrews and I don't, uh, par four greens around St Andrews, and I just think that's that's not really where we want to go. No, no. Uh, thank you, Brian. It's a good question. Right, Daniel uh, Jones. Dan, what's your? Uh, sorry, I've just called you Dan. I've got quite familiar with you there. Daniel, what's your question for Tommy? Yeah, no problem, Andrew. Um, hi, Thomas. So uh, my, my question is a bit about uh, um, lower handicap golfers. There's, there's a lot of advice there for higher handicappers and improving golfers, how to break 100, how to break 90, how to break 80. Just a bit of advice for, for lower handicap golfers. How do, you, how do you push on to become maybe a scratch golfer and to, and to regularly shoot under par so that you can, you can hit, reach that holy grail of scratch? Short game. I mean, historically, when I look at look at players, the difference between decent golfers and good golfers is the short game. It's the only place where they differ. It really is. Like they, 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 you don't chip well enough. You don't pitch well enough. You don't give yourself opportunities uh, to to get out of there. Short. There's no shortcuts with short game. It's just work, 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 work. You have to practice it. I mean, I feel that I. You know, I arguably had one of the better short games on tour uh, in my career. And for the last three or four years, I really neglected it because I've had so many other things to do and I feel it now. I'm, I'm pretty average now, just purely because I haven't put the hours into it. Uh, you know, we're all gonna miss greens. We're all gonna, it, it, that's how you put good rounds of golf together. Very rarely is the best round of golf put together by just hitting a lot of greens. It's, it's put together by getting up and down on par fives. It's put together by holding a chip or two uh, in a round of golf, uh, even for, the, for us as professionals. Short game is, is, is the thing that put great rounds together. We've all played golf where we've, we've, we've felt we've hit the ball quite well, and then you realise your playing partner, who you thought was having a scratchy round, has got up and down from everywhere and shot 68. And you yeah. hate that person intensely. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, thanks Daniel for the question. Thank you. Uh, Trus, Trus Hemstra. Uh, Trus, hello. What's your question for Thomas, Trus? Uh, my question is, um, you've been around for so many years, you had so many wins, and what was the most remarkable one and why? I think the first one for me is probably the one that stands out in the way of, I came from a country that had no European Tour winners. Um, so. To win my first event, uh, and I, I was fortunate to win it in Scotland. I was fortunate to win it at Loch Lomond, which was a, an amazing golf course. And so, to and then it was my first year on tour. So those are so many things that you know, as a kid growing up, you have dreams and you have hopes, and you get on tour and all those things, and you have a belief. But I grew up in a country where there wasn't really much, be even if I had the belief, people around didn't have much belief. We didn't have a history, history of having great, uh, great players. So to win that first one and get over the line and, and all your dreams and, and what you believe about yourself, all of a sudden you stand there and it, it comes, comes true. And, you know, that's, that's the one that will probably stand out the most for me, uh, just because it set me on my, my way. You know, I, that's, you've got to also look where you come from, and to get over the hurdle the first time on the European Tour was, uh, was an amazing feeling. Hmm. 
It was like a Gulfstream World Invitational. Loch Lomond, what a place. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, Lyle yes. Anderson, that was all oh, those that I'd love to be in Loch Lomond now. Anyway, I hope that answered your question, Truss. Uh, yes, in it the does. <laughs> Excellent. And Truss. I also had a second question. If oh, right, go allowed. on then. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Go on, then. I think it probably leads to that one already because I also wondered when you were young, you started playing golf. Uh, it must have been at a very young age. But how did you come across playing golf? I mean, was it because somebody in the family played it? Yeah, my, my parents both played and, and then I was very lucky in the way I had a, I have an older brother that's four years older than me and, and he was a very good golfer and he played uh, national team amateur golf for Denmark. So being that little one that always had somebody to look up to that was better than me and, and being quite stubborn and, and wanting to be the best at everything, it was a, it was a nice thing to have, uh, to look up to. So from a young age, having that fight, you know, when you're eight and he's 12 and, you know, you're 15 and he's 19, it, you're always so far behind that a, in the age difference. So it, it kept pushing me very, very hard. Um, so that was a that was a nice situation to have, and, and growing up that way, um, when there was big decisions to be made uh, between playing football and golf, or playing tennis and golf, uh, and I was an awful football player, even though I wouldn't admit it myself, and I was not wasn't a very good tennis player either. Uh, and they, you know, when I had to make those decisions, they they guided me in the right direction to choose golf over the other things, even though. My mind sometimes was probably, like with football, I always felt like it would be nice to be with my friends and, and play a team sport. Um, but they, they, when the big decisions were made in my life, they guided me, without telling me, they guided me in, in the right direction. So, are you terrible at other sports? Are, are there any other sports that you're good at? I'd, li I'd like to know that you're terrible at other sports. This is quite encouraging for us. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'd, mm, I, yeah. I, I'll take you on in table. I'll take you on in table tennis. There you go. A Scandinavian will always take on a Brit in table tennis. <laughs> well, I have a Chinese parentage, so I'm brilliant. Uh, so, anyway, thank you very much, Tris. You only get a second question because of your amazing floral display. So, uh, if anybody else has uh, an amazing floral display, they get a second question. Thank you very but... much. Okay, thank you. Right, next question. Where are we going? Uh, we're going to Sean Anderson. Sean, what's your question for Thomas? Thanks, Andrew. Thomas, hi. Pleasure to, to chat to you. Uh, you've obviously had many great wins over your career. Uh, what I'd like to know is, um, through your career, what measures did you, did you take to remain mentally strong through four rounds of uh, competitive golf? Um, I think, like, I, I'd always had that kind of, you know, the will to, to win uh, all was the thing that, that drove me on. I, I, Golf, the one thing that you learn with time in golf is that you, you, you go back to the trust in your golf game has to, has to, has to be there. So you've got to understand what am I good at, what am I not so good at, and then try and say, okay, well, I'm going to try and play to my strengths all the time. And that, that was one thing that I, so when we talk about course management, and I think that leads into the mental side of the game. Sometimes what I see with amateur golfers is that they, when they're playing well, they, they all of a sudden think they can walk on water. Uh, and that kind of, as a round goes on, that then that becomes a problem. And then they think it's a mental thing. No, it's, it's because you're now pushing yourself into a place where you're not comfortable. People think that they make mental mistakes. No, I think they make, they don't understand their limitations in their game. So because they, four years ago hit a great four iron on some hole and they think they can do it every time. Well, it's not going to happen when you're, when you're normally not a very good four iron player. So, so know your limitations and, uh, and play to your, to your strengths in your game all the time. Even when you're playing great, still maintain, I'm going to play to what I'm good at. Hmm. Oh, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, great advice. Kelvin van der Berg, what's your question, Kelvin, for Thomas? Hi, hi Thomas. Uh, thank you for doing this as well, and uh, welcome back to Dubai. I'm sure you're enjoying the awesome weather we're having on this side. Um, so just my question is, how do you overcome your lowest lows when you just missed out on a win? I think 
see that that's kind of the, the lowest low is not when you miss out on a win. Like I, one of the things I get asked about a lot is how did you feel? How low did you were you in the weeks after not winning the Open Championship in 2003? You know, as it is a low that you you miss out on the win, you're still not very low because you're playing great golf. The low of low is when you're when you've gone through six or eight months where you're not playing well, results are, are staying away and, and you start, like my, my indicator has always been when I start taking the game home with me. Like there's always a point where, okay, now I'm taking it into my house. And that's when you know, okay, I gotta completely regroup. I gotta completely go back to, to basics and say, okay, I'm gonna work hard and get out of it. The one thing that I always try and tell young players is, Give yourself certain things that when you achieve that, go home happy. Even though it, we know it could be better, but you've got to find something that, that gives you that kind of like uplifting feeling. Um, otherwise you're going to go, because I won 15 times on tour and I think I'm in the top 20 of all time uh, on the European tour. So you imagine, you know, as lot of guys that only win once, two or three times, well, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of misery to take home with you. But I always say, once I take it inside my four walls at home and I feel that kind of golf, 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 uh, and negative feeling, well, then, then it's time to really regroup uh, and, and start all over and kind of throw everything away and then go again. Anne-Marie Christensen, talking about sort of recovering uh, mentally from a, a tournament, has a different sort of recovery in mind. Anne-Marie, what's your question for Thomas? Well, my question is, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations, Thomas, with a really, really good career you have had. It's been a pleasure to follow you. And um, you did surprise me when I was reading that you were going to do that walk to Wales. I couldn't believe it, honestly. <laughs> I'd like to hear how long did it take to you to recover from that walk? <laughs> yeah, so when we got back to playing golf uh, after the first lockdown, um, we, we did a, a charity thing on, on a European tour kind of putting it on a golf for good program and we did all sorts of different things and and one of the things I did through the first lockdown was I went for some pretty long walks um, and then somebody said well why don't we take the we were going back to Wales uh, and it was 10 years since we the Ryder Cup had been in Wales so why don't we take the Ryder Cup trophy back to Wales so I walked from our head offices in Wentworth uh, to Wales, which was uh, 210 kilometers, and I did it over three and a half days uh, as a charity walk. Um, that was not a good idea. <laughs> it was a great. It sounded like a great idea when we started. Now it was a, it was a fantastic experience uh, to to do that, and and you know you walk, I walked 12 hours a day, and uh, and. You know, you, you kind of sit out and think, well, that's going to be fine, it's not. But after two days, it's, it, it really was a battle. Um, and to recover, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of ice baths uh, for, for a lot of days. I mean, my shins never really... Uh, I still get, when I do a long walk today, I still get some, uh, some flaring up from it. So it's, uh, if you ever venture out and do long walks, it's, uh, you've got to be prepared for it. It was fun to do, but it was, uh, it was a tough task. And it was, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to do it anytime soon again, but uh, it's certainly something that I, that I enjoyed uh, being part of. That was a great effort. We'll just nip ahead to Darren Wright's question because, uh, Darren, you've got a sort of Danish-themed question. Uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, very nice to virtually meet you and thanks for this great opportunity. Um, you mentioned uh, in one of your previous um, responses your, your 15 European Tour wins. And, and my question uh, initially is a closed question, but it'd be great if you could elaborate on your uh, probable yes or no answer, um, which is um, if you're unfortunate enough to, to not um, extend your 15 European Tour wins, um, do you think uh, that Rasmus, uh, with two wins as a teenager, uh, is uh, is going to eclipse your 15 win, become the most successful Danish golfer? Yeah, I mean, I, so let me put it this way. Like, I have no, I'm really comfortable with what I've achieved in my career and I'm happy with what I've done. And when these young Danish players come out, I want 
all the success in the world for them. Rasmus has the ability, and so does Nikolai, i, I got to say, as, as they are maybe in a little bit of a different place right now, uh, the two of them. But the talent they have and possess is, um, is right up there with the best. Uh, three players have stood out in my career as they arrived on tour, Tiger Woods being one. Um, Rory McIlroy and Sergio Garcia are three players that have stood out for me as golfers. And I gotta say, these two are exceptional talents. Uh, not really seen many since Rory's arrival that probably gets close. So they have all the ability and, and if they live up to their ability, I mean, they'll, they'll go, they should and, and will go far beyond what I've achieved and, and that would be great. Erasmus has ability to win major championships the way he plays the game. So a lot of credit to the Danish Federation and, the, and their coaching teams there, what they have achieved. And to, I just want to see them achieve the best things because I've had a wonderful, wonderful career and wonderful life with the game of golf. And I know how much it does, how much good it does for you as a person. So I want them to, uh, to live that life to the full and, and achieve the best possible things for them. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, they're worth, worth following. They really are. And Rasmus is, uh, yeah, I mean, to win twice in your first 19 starts when you're a teenager is, is pretty remarkable, to be honest. Thanks for the question, Dan. We've just got time for a couple more questions. So we've got Brian Marshall in a minute, but then Alan Craig, first of all. Alan, what's your uh, question for Thomas? Hi, Thomas. Um, thanks very much for speaking to me today. I wanted to ask you about Ryder Cup selection. And in your opinion, do you think the Ryder Cup captain should have more picks, or do you think the way that it's currently selected is right? Uh, I mean, I had four picks. I, I wouldn't have had any more. I mean, when I when I actually did the picks, I, I probably would have liked to have had six, but then I would have to leave even more players out. So it's it's a it's a tough one. Um, it's a tough question. You know, some captains are very lucky. Uh, they land on. It becomes quite obvious uh, the picks that they have to make, and some some captains are very unlucky that they you know you've got to pick very few from a. A big group of players. Um, certainly, when I made the picks, it was uh, it was certainly a topic of conversation a lot um, because of who I went for. Um, thank God they stood up and, and delivered. <laughs> so that was uh, that makes it a lot easier and a, and a lot happier captain. But um, I was fortunate that. Uh, that I had a, a group of players that really did show up, and, and Tommy and, and Frankie and you know Henrik probably was the, the the quiet hero for me that week, the way he went about uh, things. But they delivered, and that was uh, that made a good substance to the team and, and for everyone else to to follow suit. Make it twelve picks. That's what I say. I'm with I'm with Monty. Um, make it twelve picks and make the captain the bad guy. Opens it to massive bribery and corruption as well. So I say that uh, just uh, yeah. twelve twelve wild cards. Anyway, thank you, Alan, for that um, that question. Right, the final question. This is a good question as well from Brian Marshall. Brian, let's take us inside the Ryder Cup. Brian, what's your question for Thomas? Well, hi Thomas. Uh, congratulations on your fantastic win in Paris. Um, it wasn't just the fact that you won, it was the way that you handled the whole week. Uh, my question is to do with the Ryder Cup, and when you consider that all of the players in the Ryder Cup are world-class, individual golfers, they play individually, um, they have their own coaches, they have their own psychologists, etc., and then they come to you as a team, and you've got to add something to whatever it is that they do for a week. And what is it exactly that you do? And another slightly different question is, would you have approached the Ryder Cup differently had you been playing in America rather than in Paris? Um, you are right that they, they are individual golfers and they, they come in uh, as, a, as a group, but you treat them as individuals. That was my whole thing. I, I didn't want them, like, I've seen captains at times try and, okay, it's the 12 of us, uh, the 12 players and the captain, and that's us for the week. 
that's that's not how I saw it. I see it as okay. So they are twelve individuals. I got to get the best out of those twelve individuals. I don't want to take their coaches and their, uh, all those people away from them. I encourage them to have all the people that they work with on a day-to-day -day basis. I wanted them all to be there. I wanted them all to be part, feel part of the team. I want all their families there, because. The Ryder Cup is not about just the players. You know, all those people put all their lives into a player's career. And one of the big achievements for any golfer is to play in a Ryder Cup team. So I wanted all of them to be part of it. So I spent a lot of time speaking to the support staff around them and to the families and wives and girlfriends and understanding that if all of those people are happy and all of those things are working for a common goal, the golfers are not that important, they're just going to be happy. Actually, the one thing you want to take away from them is to think, oh, is she happy over there? Is he getting the right into the right places? Is all this? That's the one thing I wanted to take away from them. I wanted all the players to understand, no, we're all in this together. So our Ryder Cup team is not 12 players and a captain. For me, it was 100 people. They all had to work in sync and make sure that they had the best week of their lives. That gave an opportunity for those 12 to go out and perform on the golf course and be in a great frame of mind. My goal was really to make sure that everything around was creating an environment where they felt the most comfortable that they could. And then I, I was comfortable that if we created that environment, they would go out and play their best golf. Now, you can't get all 12 to play their best golf, but if you get eight of them to play great golf, you've got a, a very big chance of winning the Ryder Cup. And that's what we achieved. Um, would I have approached it different going to America? Uh, yes, I would have kept the group a lot tighter. Like I would have, I would have created almost, tried to create a bubble around that whole 80, 90, people because now you're in a hostile environment and no matter how we twist or turn it, it is a hostile environment for a European team in America, as it is for an American team in Europe. Um, it is, so you've got to keep that, like we are, it's us against the world kind of feel of going out to achieve something. Uh, it's a lot easier obviously when you're in Europe and you've got the fans with you and you've got, you know, it, it's your setup. You create the environment that you want to create. I created an environment, locker room wise, team room wise, that I I had the best facilities for them that was available, because we had that choice as a home team. So you create that, that environment that's a little bit easier to exist in. Where when you're in America, you try and keep it okay. We keep it tight. We want to stay away from the American crowds as much as possible. We want to you know keep our our group close together. Uh, so yes, I would approach it a little bit different in America than I did in Europe, but it's also then as a captain in, in Europe, it's a lot bigger job in the sense of you are involved in everything. Every decision that's made about golf course, about setup, about all the ceremonies and all the things, you are making those decisions. Where if you're in America, you are literally the captain of the team and, and only concentrating about the golf side and the American captain is, is dealing with all of those things. So it is a bigger job when you're in Europe, but it's, um, it's a more enjoyable job when it goes well, let's put it that way. <laughs> well, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Brian. I actually said that was the last question, and I was entirely wrong, not for the first time in my career, um, because James Pearson is there. James has a good question. This is a test for you, though, James, because I think your original question was on how you might do things differently in, the, in a Ryder Cup if things weren't going well. So this is where you've got to think on your feet during a, a live interview and you've got to come up with some other questions. So have you got another question for Thomas? Right, no, no pressure. I'll, I'll, I'll try and do. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, hi, Thomas. Hi from, from Hoylake. Um, I was surprised not to see you in the latest uh, Angry Golfers piece that the year <laughs> do. Um, I just wondered if you could uh, maybe share, share a time uh, when you might have seen Red. Oh, God. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Uh, I got a text message from Jamie Spence the other day, uh, who's uh, we we used to call him the Tasmanian Devil when he played. So he said, "Angry golfers, these, these are only beginners. It should be you, me, Howard Clark, and Juan Quiros in this video, which goes back to a completely different level of angry golfers in in my certainly in my younger days." Um, yeah, I I did say that. I was surprised I wasn't in it, but I I think. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen 
I've seen red a few times on the golf course. It's an infuriating game at times, but uh, yeah, there's, there's been a couple of incidents where when you get back to the hotel room, you, you, you're not proud of yourself, that's for sure. But that sport sometimes, it, it gets, you know, emotions are there and, and it, it creeps. But I thought it was a fantastic video, and and one of the one of like when going back to the Ryder Cup, one of the players I had to uh, protect a lot from from media uh, and and from from the outside world was Tyrrell, and I thought uh, that video shows a lot about what he is. I mean, he's a quality guy and a great. Uh, he was great in the team room, and yes, he gets a, a rap a little bit about the way he is on the golf course, but. You can't argue with that he gets the best out of himself. And, and you know, players are different. It's difficult. I, I always get that more, not so much that I'm, I, my reactions to things, but more the way I look on the golf course. And I, I, I sometimes have looked at myself back in time and thought, God, you look miserable uh, on the golf course. But I'm, I, sometimes I'm just in the world of like, this is where I am. And I, if I got to go and interact with people and all that, I lose myself in, in what I'm trying to do. And then you end up looking the most miserable sod out there. And it's, it's, it's a shame that it is like that. But I think we're just all different in that way. And, and uh, the Angry Golfer video shows a lot about what we're about as a, as a tour. Uh, you know that kind of uh, dark sense of humor and 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 the way we are with each other and and that brings out a lot of good in each other um, and I think something like till do something like that video helps him win last week because it kind of gives him all of a sudden the thumbs up and the things on the golf course kind of gives him a people attracted to him and he's never really felt that kind of of way that people actually find him quite funny and and look forward to him losing the head a little bit and sticking his thumb up and then then it's okay but um yeah i i just uh yeah sometimes we we see red and and i think passion needs to be in sport i, I do think the passion needs to be in sport and sometimes i think we get criticized heavily for something that's not as bad as it might uh, initially look, and 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 that's a balance act. But but sometimes, yeah, I've, I've crawled into bed at night thinking, um, I wonder who's going to give me a, a slap on the wrist tomorrow morning when I get to the golf course. Mm. That's a good question, James, as well. Coming up with that one, see, there we are, thinking on your feet. Who do you think's the player I least looked forward to interviewing when he'd bogeyed the last <laughs> hole? Who do you think, Thomas? Monty. <laughs> <laughs> Every single time. I was, I was trying to track him down as much as anything else. He'd be <laughs> crawling through kitchen windows to get away from you and things like that. Anyway. Oh, good. Right. Anyway, so there we go. That's a nice positive note on which to end. We're all different personalities. And as long as we're angry just with ourselves, it's fine. That's what golf does to you. But it's a brilliant sport. And thank you for, uh, for uh, sharing your thoughts over the last hour or so, Thomas. It's been wonderful. And thank you to all of you for uh, producing your questions. And many thanks to Hilton for helping put this together. It has been another uh, Hilton chat with, this time with Thomas Bjorn. So a round of applause, please, for Thomas Bjorn. Everyone, you're all on mute, but it doesn't matter. We can see you. There we are. Just lots of hands flapping around. Anyway, thank you, Thomas, and uh, best of luck this week. And uh, happy birthday next month when it comes. Enjoy the seniors too. All the best, Thomas. Thank you. To watch another European Tour video, click here. And to subscribe, click here.